my aim is to talk about model theory, uh, but first, before I start talking about model theory, I want to motivate it by giving you two results about fields which have relatively easy proofs using model theory. So somehow first we see some applications and then we will try to understand what was used from model theory and what these theorems really mean. And then we will prove this model theoretic theorems which will be used in these applications. So, okay, the first one, uh, the first one is about access theorem. <coughs> Our site was proved, I think, independently by Grothendieck at the same time, so some people call it Axe-Grotendieck theorem. So before stating it, uh, let us, okay, we will work, so we will work over complex numbers. But Everything will be true over any algebraically closed field. But to fix our attention, let's focus on these complex numbers. So let's start from one polynomial. Okay, I'm not sure, so let me in the beginning try to describe everything. So this is ring of polynomials in one variable. Okay, how do I call it? A remark, ah, and also this f, so by f I also denote the corresponding function. Okay. So let's start from something very easy. So first remark. Jeez. May not look, just not the best statement on its own, but it leads nicely to the access theorem. So it's quite easy to observe that if f is one to one, then F is on to. So let's prove it. Actually, much less will be used than one to one. So proof. So if F is one to one, then of course F cannot be constant. So actually this will be enough to show over C that F is on to. So now take any element in C. And define new polynomial. So this one, since we subtract constant, is also not constant. So, because C is algebraically closed, 
every non-constant polynomial has a zero, so this g has a zero. Some zero, let's say z. So then we see that zero g of z. So f of z is b, and this b was arbitrary, so f is on to. Okay. So access theorem will be the statement, but generalized from one variable to n, n variables. So now, just some more remarks. Huh. Okay. So remark two, it's of course not true for any field. So remark one. It's not true, for instance, for rationals replacing C. So take function x to power 3. It is one to one, even on reals. But of course, not every rational number is a third cube. So it's not always true. Uh, huh. Now problem, okay, so there will be problem. So problems will appear on the board. There is no problem list as such. So problem number one, still easy. Show that this remark one is true for reals. Quite easy. Uh, okay, and one can wonder do we have opposite implication? But of course not. So let me write it. So uh, opposite implication. In remark one is of course not true. Just take any polynomial of degree at least two. Since it is algebraically closed, it is on two, but it's not one to one. Okay, any questions so far? This should be pretty easy. Yes, so any non-constant polynomial on algebraically closed field is on two, but just linear ones are uh, one to one. But the other one is true, so now the access theorem, as I said, would be generalization from one to more variables, so let us fix and fix now n polynomials in n variables over C. Yes, so these are polynomials. And variables. 
And so it's often a mistake when the same index appears twice, but it's not a mistake here. As many polynomials, as many variables. And now consider a function. Okay, in this case, this function was basically the same as the polynomial. Now we take one function using function using this n polynomials. So consider capital F. Just on each coordinate, it has this f1 up to fn. So f of z1 to zn. comes from this choice <coughs> of polynomials. So the access theorem is now like remark one, but for capital F. So as I said, some people say X got and dig, but let me say just X. Sorry, rotten dick. So if f is one to one, then uh, f is on to. <coughs> okay, so we want to prove it. So this is the first theorem I want to prove using some model theory, and that will motivate this notions and statements from model theory, which will be used here. I need one little technical thing. So I will say okay, let's now K be any field. So I say that X theorem holds for K. Well, if, if it holds for K, yes, if, if the above statement is for K replacing C. So of course, it's also interesting to ask for which other fields uh, this is true. But in the proof, I will need to use, I will first, I will show that access theorem holds for some other fields. And from these other fields, I will get into C. That's why I need to have such a notion. Uh, huh. So maybe first, before the proof, kind of examples, when it holds and when it does not hold. <coughs> so we see by remark two that even for n equal one, it does not hold for Q. And actually this week I was thinking that probably it also does not hold for R, but I couldn't find any example. And then I started to search and it turns out that it holds for R. So there is quite, and funny thing is it was proved even before X proved it for C. I didn't know that. So, yeah, we need to keep it all out together with Rosenlicht. Showed that X theorem holds for R. So I'm just saying it on the side. We will not discuss it. 
But okay, it's more complicated, more complicated argument than for C, but it also holds for R. Ah. They use huh? They use no, no, they used geometric arguments. <coughs> they used something called Brouwer invariance of domain. So it says there is an old theorem of Brouwer saying that any any continuous one-to-one -one function from Rn to Rn is open. It takes open sets to open sets. And then using this, I didn't look at the full argument, or some cohomology, it's, it's topological geometric argument. And such arguments also, uh, also may work for Rax theorem, but I will show the other, another argument. Uh, and just by coincidence, so this is, this was pretty famous Polish algebraic geometer, and I just got an email that he died on Monday, oh. 85 years old. <coughs> so, somehow his name often pops up, like in the 60s he was doing things which had kind of flavor of model theory. Also some like, okay, it's another topic like, Difference differential Galois theory, some fleets with operators, also some universal algebra, and then he moved to algebraic geometry, I think, or he was interested in more topics before. But anyway, he unfortunately passed away at the age of 85 on Monday. Uh, okay, so now let's start proving access theorem. It will be in three steps. So, step one, the access theorem. Holds for finite fields. And actually that's the main reason, which is quite obvious. Okay, so actually we use this and after that there will be two more steps which will be kind of formal manipulations, but one can say that somehow it's a very strange thing that this is the kind of statement that if we show first it holds for finite fields, then we can conclude from that it, it also holds for these very infinite fields of complex numbers. And you will see how. And I think Sir has a paper about more statements like this. The title is something like how to prove theorems about infinite fields using finite fields. And he also gives this example. Uh, so proof of step one. So this is quite clear for any finite set. For any finite set V and any function, let's say denoted the same way, I hope we all know very well that even equivalence is true. So F is one to one, F is on to, even if and only if. But this other implication somehow does not transfer to infinite fields. So taking V equal some FQ, this is a finite field to N, we are done. In particular, if it's one to one, 
it's on to any function, but also any function on fields is a polynomial function, so any function is not a great generality here. Okay, so we have this for finite fields. So now from finite fields, okay, step two, let P be prime number and F be out. So this is So I hope you know what it means. Maybe most of you have now a course in Galois theory, actually. Okay. <clears throat> yes, so it's the smallest, smallest algebraically closed field containing this field of P elements. So it's a union of all finite extensions of FP. So in other words, it's a union of all finite fields of characteristic P, which we will use. Okay, but I hadn't finished the statement. Then, so this is, of course, field of P elements, which is the same as Z of NPZ. Uh, then, access theorem. Holds for this field, which is now infinite. So it's a union of finite fields, but of course it's infinite. Each algebraic closed field must be infinite. So proof of this step. Yes, so we can see we are getting kind of closer and closer to C in a way. First, we have finite field, which is quite far conceptually from complex numbers. But now we get something looking a bit similar because this one is also algebraically closed, like complex numbers. Okay. Huh. So I need you to recall some facts about finite fields. So first, okay, for each M, so probably you know it, but let me make sure, there is a unique finite field of cardinality unique up to isomorphism of cardinality p to the m denoted fpm, which I already used this notation here. Uh, okay. Now the question is where and when to such fields embed into each other. So not always one this exponent one exponent has to divide the other. So if M divides K, then we can think that one of them is a subfield of the other. And you can write it explicitly. So actually, if you want to know how exactly, then these are those elements from FPK such that x to power pm is x. 
a splitting field of this XPM to minus X polynomial. Okay, so this is how one finite field is embedded into another. Huh? M divides K. So it's often confusing. So, for example, F4 does not embed into F8 because 2 does not divide 3. But 4 divides 8, <laughs> but 2 does not divide 3. I mean, I guess every year I'm at least once confused about it. But <clears throat> so this is. Uh, this is like a divisibility relation, like they are included in each other. <clears throat> okay, and then we can, if we understand that, then we can kind of understand what is FP arch. So as I said, FP arch is the union, one can say of all this FPM. But then we have to understand in what sense it's a union, so how one is included into another, so in this way. So, inclusions as in part two. So it's not an increasing union. It's like this divisibility relation. Every two finite fields are embedded into another one, but it's not true that it's an increasing union, but we can make it increasing union, which will be convenient, just if we take bigger and bigger numbers which divide each other, so if we take factorials. Increasing now, this denotes increasing union, Yes, because of course m factorial divides m plus 1 factorial. So now I made it in such a way it is increasing union just by skipping some fields. Okay, that's all the three things I wanted you to recall. So now the actual argument starts. <coughs> okay, so we are proving this axe. So we have these polynomials f1, fn in fp arch x1, xn. I, because of this, yes, so they have all these n polynomials, they have coefficients which live in this increasing union. So there are finitely many polynomials, together they have finitely many coefficients, so they must live on some finite level. So there is some, there is some m, such that they all go to this FPM factorial. Okay, all the coefficients I can find on some finite level. Just picking one by one and waiting where they finally, all of them, fall into one of these finite fields. <clears throat> so then, also for all k greater than m, since this field fpk factorial is bigger, they belong to the coefficients are also in the bigger field. But th that means, okay, but then the function f, so it means that for all k 
Okay, greater than m. Yes, this function, they all have coefficients from this f p k factorial. So the function f takes this the same yield. Yes, because everything everything is happening always on the same on the same field for this chosen k, which is at least m. So we can and of course since f is okay, let me write everything. Since f is one to one, then f restricted to this is also one to one. So we can apply step one to see that this function is on two. For all k greater than m, okay, this function is on two. So here we have actually equality. But then it means if for all k, but now our FPH is union of all these fields, so since Yes, I can start this union. I don't have to start from the very beginning. I can start on any from any moment. So since FPH is the union like this, we get that F FPH n equals fph n so okay f is on to as we wanted because it was on to on each finite level from some point on Let me wait. Any question to that? Yes. Somehow, from some point on, from this finite level M, everything was controlled on this finite levels, and on finite levels, function was on to by by step one. So it was on to on on the full field. Ah. So question to you, what would go wrong if you were trying to prove that on to implies one to one? Because step one is also true for the other direction, but on FPH it is not true. So what would collapse? Yeah, maybe it's a good moment to pause, so let us think. Uh, <laughs> maybe broadcasting thinking will, be, will not be so great. <laughs> so, question.
false implication Ah, okay, that. So we can think a bit. This may be. Hmm. Problem. One point five. <coughs> one and a half. Huh? <laughs> Yes, yes, so what is wrong? Uh, I mean, on, uh, on the, if it's on to on the outbreak, so it doesn't mean it's on to Yes, so on one to one goes to, yeah. goes to smaller things, but on, on to ness does not, so it's not. So this one, uh, okay, so the answer is this. This implication would not be true if we. Yeah, so this is how the other thing breaks. That we cannot, we cannot kind of lift this other implication to to the union. Okay, so we have step two. Now finally the last one. So, so far, there was no model theory. Is there a concrete example uh, huh? for a concrete example that not one to one? Again, anything of degree at least two. Because it's such a very close field, yes? So everything, everything is on two, which is non constant, but they cannot be one to one. The same. If or n equal one, even. Yeah. Okay, so there was, okay, one could say maybe there was a little bit of logic <laughs> into this implication, but not much, but there was no model theory yet, so now it will come. So step three, I actually access the main statement, so access theorem for C. Uh, how do I put it? Uh, okay, so just directly. So now there is, okay, so now you may not fully understand what I mean by this. So I'm saying that for any D which hasn't appeared yet, it will be like degree, and N is our N. There is A sentence, so this will have a proper meaning, like sentence, we know what is sentence in a language like English, Turkish, or Polish, but this will be something very precisely defined in next lectures. There is a sentence in the language of rings. So this will be also properly defined. Now we will just have some intuitive meaning. Let us call it e dn expressing that access theorem Holds for those F1, Fn, but with extra restriction 
that the total degree of them is at most d. Okay, ah, so total degree. Shall I say what I mean by that? Okay, total degree. So if you have a polynomial, so on the side, you have some polynomial f. Then total degree is just sum, maximum of the sums when it's so. I mean, of course, such that <laughs> yes, so just the sum of the degrees of the monomials which appear. Okay, so th at this moment, okay, you may ask, what do I mean? And I will not explain it now. I will explain it a bit later, but. If we, the point is that if we bound a degree for each, but always, of course, any such f1, fn, they belong. There is some d which bounds the total degree. So there is always, for any given capital F, there is a sentence like this expressing that Axe theorem is true for this kinds of capital F. Okay? But there is no one sentence for all possible Fs. We will understand it later. So first, we have to accept it. This notion makes sense and such a sentence exists. I will describe what it means after this and the second example. And then there is a theorem, model theoretic theorem. <coughs> huh? It's not hard thing to write this first order sentence. Ah, there will be, it is. It's not, it's not hard to understand it exists, but we will soon see example. We will write the sentence for d equal one and n equal two. And I think this board will be barely enough. <laughs> okay, because it's, it's clear how to do it, but when you start writing, it suddenly gets long, 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 long. Okay, so it depends what you mean by easy. Anybody can do it if you have a big board and time. I, I was thinking the writing statements. As yeah, probably if you have some experience, you see it's possible already. Yes. Yeah. But I'm assuming you don't even know, people don't even know what it means fully. Ask, is there a trick? Do we need any trick to write? Yeah, so you can also see probably it's impossible to do it for all possible degrees at once, but if you bound the degree, it's possible. Okay, but still, it's not over, of course. Uh, what's the time? Ah, so I have two minutes, maybe, so I'm... So theorem. So this will be model theoretic theorem number one. So for any, so if phi is any sentence, in language of rings, then <coughs> he is true in complex numbers if and only if for infinitely many primes p is true in FP alt. So that would require a bit of, so we will prove it, maybe in, in the third or fourth meeting. 
Yeah, so this is like example of model theoretic statement. Something talking about sentences and how are they true in one field and in the others. Okay, it's also called Lepschetz principle. So then, I hope it is clear that by theorem MT1 and step two, we are done. So, okay, this may be a good moment for a break and maybe 45 minutes past. So, okay, but, okay, if we can, questions for that? Uh -huh. For that, for that theorem, you, you have to prove that by theorem MT1 and step two, we are done for theorem MT1, right? So we are done, meaning step three is done. Step three, oh, okay. Oh. Sorry. I thought that we are done for step two. Which is also the end of proving X. So, okay, is it clear that we are really done? We take this, we have this function F, for this F, there is some D which bounds the degree. We have this formula, but by step two, it is true for all FPH. So by this theorem, it's true also here. That's... Are we going to prove MT1? We will, we will, but later. First, we will understand what this means. So that will may happen today or, to, or on Saturday. And then next time, we will prove MT1.